Praise the Lord. Well, this has been good today. I've I'm, I'm enjoyed these songs, these groups. It uh, adds something. Appreciate Sister Jody helping us with that and uh, all of the, everyone that's took part. And, uh, you know, I'm like Brother Tally. I, <clears throat> it's hard to say I'm doing all I can do when you know, you know, Surely something more I can do. And even, you almost leave the surely out and just say there's more that I can do. <laughs> it, it's hard to find that balance, you know. I, you, can, you can get so diligent that you're, you know, you're doing everything in your mind that you think God may want you to do. At the same time, if you slow down and meditate a little bit, you realize there's... Maybe I'm missing it. There may be some things I need to get God's mind on to try to get his direction, like Brother Tally was saying, uh, for God to direct our steps, for what we're doing to be ordered of the Lord. The steps of a good man, the Bible says. and I know that means women too. Uh, it's talking about mankind are ordered of the Lord. So <clears throat> we we need that. We need, uh, uh, I remember going to, you know, all the <clears throat> meetings that we go to in the body and uh, used to have, hear different men get up and say, you don't have to pray about coming to these meetings. You're supposed to be here. This is, it's, you know, this is, we're, this is our, uh, it's necessary for us to be here. I mean, they used to put it on us pretty strong, you know. And I do believe that it, uh, the pastors and ministers that are especially leading men in the body ought to be working and laboring together and seeking God for, for his direction for the body of Christ. Uh, but I remember one time Brother Cornelius get, Mears getting up and he said, I think you ought to pray about coming to these meetings. <laughs> of course, he was, he, was, he was a pretty big man. He's not alive anymore, but at that time he was pretty, had a pretty great voice. Didn't anybody challenge him on what he said? He said, I still pray about every meeting I go to because you don't know if God you know, may have something special for you. There may be a reason you can't make that particular meeting and, you know, he was just really letting us know that you still need to be led by God in whatever you do, even though you have a general conception of what God wants you to do, you still need to be open for God's leading uh, in everything that you do. These songs today on, you know, the Lord giving thanks to him and appreciation for all that he's done is... Uh, it's really touched me down deep because it's made me realize and stop and think about, you know, what all God has done for me and realize that his hand's been on my life. And I mentioned in uh, Bible study downstairs that <clears throat> the, um, you know, that, that those back there in the early church overcame by the word of their testimony. And I've used that quite a bit here of late because it's, <clears throat> it's something that has stood out to me that, you know, I, nobody has my testimony. Nobody has yours. And God's dealing with you and your life, and but you still have your life to live, and that's your testimony. And you will only overcome the flesh, you know, the uh, <clears throat> works of the flesh through God's help. And that's your testimony, and nobody else has it. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's something unique, you know, about us as members in particular in the body of Christ that nobody has. In fact, there's a scripture in, uh, in Ephesians. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> uh, 
in the in the fourth chapter. <clears throat> in fact, I'll just back up a little bit. This is a a uh, foundation uh, chapter in the Bible for us down here uh, in the latter part of the Gentile world. Uh, let me start in uh, Ephesians 4 and and uh, the seventh verse. It says, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, you've been measured uh, out grace according to the gift of Christ. Now, he gave you everything. But it's still measured out. You can't you can't receive this all in one lump sum. It's just impossible. It you just have to get it here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept on precept. You you cannot inhibit uh, all or inhabit all that God has for you uh, when you come to Him in salvation. Or I don't care where you're at in your stage of growth with God. God's measuring this out to you. He's given it to you as, uh, how did he say it? To whom much is given, much is required. You could deduce from that statement that to whom little is given, little is required. You, when you first come to God, if you, if you go back to Acts the 15th chapter when Paul went to Jerusalem to get an answer from the apostles <clears throat> concerning the Gentiles, because a lot of pressure was being put on him that they needed to be circumcised. The Judaizers still wanted to bring them under the law, and he knew that that wasn't required under the new covenant. But he needed he needed some some strength from the apostles, and of course, after much deliberation. Uh, James come up with the answer and they decided just to write a letter to send it back to the Gentiles that they weren't to eat anything strangled to, to you know, to, to uh, stop all fornication, uh, to uh, not worship any idols, to see, eat anything strangled and what was the other one? Something that had to do with blood also. There in the end of the 15th chapter. So, and that's all that they required of the Gentiles. Well, that's because they, what is it? All right, so they required little of them. They, there wasn't much requirement. They, they, they left out all of those other things. Uh, but you have to remember the Gentiles were new. They were just coming in and receiving the things of God and they weren't requiring, they weren't required much. But as they served God, more was measured out to them and to whom much was given, much was required. And so, you know, and that's the way it is with your walk with God. In your testimony, the more... You serve him. And the more you learn of him, the more he's going to require of you. Not, he's not, you know, here's the thing. God's not requiring, it's not all about do's and don'ts. It's about righteousness and you growing and developing and mortifying the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. The spirit of God has to help you. I could tell you all day to quit doing something maybe you were doing that you ought not be doing. But until God really deals with you, you're just doing it as unto a law. But when God works it in your heart, it, it, it becomes something personal in your testimony and your walk with God. And when God works that in your life, it becomes a part of your character. It's not a, no longer a law. But it's your character. I do right because... It's right to do. It's the right thing to do. And God's 
fixed my mind on that. He's helped me to understand righteousness. How did Paul say it in the fifth chapter of Ephesians when he said, He that's of full age uh, discerneth both good and evil. So, But it takes maturity to get to a place that, you know, it may be easy for you some things to say, Well, I know that's wrong and I know this is all right. But then there's things in life that gets to be, you know, a gray area. Is that right or is that wrong? You ever had the Lord, have you ever had the Lord talk to you and then you get to thinking, is this God talking to me or is this the devil? Is this me? Is this my mind working overtime or is God really talking to me? Well, if you haven't been there, you will get there. Because sometimes it's not easy to discern. Is this God directing me? God talking to me? Sometimes you have to know the Lord. You have to get to know Him. You have to exercise uh, working with God uh, before you know. He said, my sheep know my voice. Well, I'm, I don't want to tell you I'm not His sheep, but sometimes I don't know his, if it's His voice. Sometimes I have to be honest and say, I'm learning of him and I'm learning I'm having to learn his voice. You know, sometimes man has planted things in my mind that I thought was the voice of God, but the more I've served him, the more I've learned more about his word, I found out that was ideology. That was someone's idea. That was something someone idolized, they they were able to influence me by it. But the more I've served him, the more I've realized that, you know, I don't, I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't want you to feel like that traditions and uh, uh, customs are not important. They are. Uh, commandments are important. There's these commandments in the Bible are important for you to keep your flesh under control while you're serving God until righteousness becomes a part of your character. In other words, you, you can't just let your flesh run wild. It'll choke out the things of God. So you've got you've to you've keep your, your flesh corralled with, with commandments. But you shouldn't always have to have a commandment of a do and a don't in serving God. That children have to have that. Little kids growing up, they got to know what mama said, no, you don't do that. Daddy said, no, you stop that. But sooner or later they get old enough, they don't have to be told not to do certain things. You know, uh, and and uh, <clears throat> so in in the Lord you you have to grow and develop to a place that you're not serving God in in a law or a commandment that that's the best you could do under the law of Moses you no one under under the law of Moses could overcome the the flesh the works of the flesh. No one was born again that had the character of God that could develop in them. All they could do was just bring it under a law. And the law could never uh, cause you to lose consciousness of sin because sin was there every year. You had to get sacrifices for your sin. Every year you had to... Uh, get forgiveness for him through the high priest and and that's the best that the law could come up with but under grace Jesus came and showed through a new birth through being born again you could be born of a nature that you you could develop in that nature that's the, this born again nature of the holy ghost is it's, it's a nature of God that we become part of Him. He becomes part of us in that nature, but, but you'll have to develop the mind for that nature to function 
You, your mind will have to develop. Your mind is carnal. The Bible says you're just a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> just a little kid. Just the, the nature of, of humanity. Adam. Adam's nature. None of us were born of God when we hit, you know, when we came to this earth. We were born of Adam. We were of the Adamic race. And and we have to be born again of God to be reconciled to him. And, and when we're born of that nature, whether you like it or not, you've got two natures in you once you have that birth. You've still got the Adamic nature, and you've still got, and you've got God's nature. But your mind <clears throat> has to be transformed. Your, it has to be renewed. Uh... Uh, where's that scripture at in in Colossians, uh, the third chapter, uh, and the the uh, the tenth verse says, "And have put on the new man." That's what Paul called this new birth. He called it an inner man, a new man. He called it. <clears throat> you put on the new man which, re, re, which is renewed in knowledge. See, it has to do with your mind. You're, you're going to have to re, be renewed in the knowledge of God's righteousness after the image of him that created him. So <clears throat> God created this, this new man, this Christ-like man, this god made nature. God created that in the beginning, but you have to be renewed. And, and that's what we're all going through. We're all going through a, a renewal process and a transformation where our minds are not controlled. You can't be your own God. That's something marvelous about God. He... he We're all, we all, God made us with a will, free will. You, you have a will. Uh, he did, he's not making you do anything. But we are, uh, you know, when you're born of Adam, it's like Brother Tally said, you, you, you have to have God's help to be, led of God or, or to find out or to become righteous you just automatically the fallen nature of Adam the flesh nature of Adam uh, without God without God's dealing God's help even in the beginning Adam in the garden he had to have God's help the Lord had to help him to know what he could do and what he couldn't do what he could eat and not eat and by the way, if you're still believing that he ate an apple and that God cursed him forever because of that, you're, you know, you're, you're just getting a little bitty spark of knowledge that's had nothing to do with an apple. <laughs> you know, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, <clears throat> he was not to eat of, and that was Adam. Adam was that tree. Jesus was the tree of life, and he wasn't to do his own will. He, God made us with a will. That, and, and, God, and, and that's what's great about God because he didn't make us into little, what's the word I'm wanting, you know, little puppets. He didn't, he, he didn't fix us where we had to do righteousness. If God would have done that, he could have just, number one, he wouldn't have had anybody that, that served him because and served righteousness because they loved righteousness and hated iniquity. He would have just had a bunch of people that he made to serve him, and he wouldn't have been happy with that because he wants you to really be righteous. He wants you to really develop righteousness in your life. He wants you to have an everlasting life in righteousness, but. As I've said many times, if God took this class right here to heaven today, hell would break out on the streets of glory by tomorrow morning. 
because we're not ready for that. Because somebody in here would be jealous or be covetousness, or have covetousness, or somebody would would have a wrong spirit, and we'd have exactly in heaven what we got right here. And I, I love all of you, but I don't like everything about all of you, no more than you like everything about me. You know, and you know how I know that? You say, well, you don't know what I like and don't like. I know my wife. And if you got to know me as good as she did, you'd, you'd say the same thing she says. I love you, but I don't like everything about you because I'm, I'm still in the mold. I'm, <laughs> I'm still going through the process, you know. And so uh, we, we have to stay together. I've stayed together with her now 50 years, so I think I'm going to make it, you know. I sure ain't willing to start all over on this project. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> we're 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 going to see this thing out to the end. That's my walk with God. That you know that's God's. That's that's a beautiful picture of serving God. Marriage is because you you when you are born of God, you're His child, and you got to stick it out. With the family of God from now on, I'm, it's like a marriage. He, <coughs> he's my Savior. I'm joined to Him. I'm born of Him. I can't get away from that. I know, Sister Alexander, I can make my bed in hell and He'll be there. I've, been, I've already done that. I was young, but I did that many years ago. I found out you can't escape Him. He has a right to deal with His children. And uh, I was his child, and believe me, he dealt with me. And he has dealt with me, and he still deals with me. I had a 77-year-old man write me this week and tell me, he said, you know, I, I had to go in the hospital and have surgery, and I had complications. And he said, I'm not going to tell you what the judgment was, but I believe God was judging me. 77 years old. He said, he said I just believe the Lord loved me enough to deal with me about something, and, and he used this. I, I'm thankful for people that think like that, that they're searching God in everything that they do, and, you know, and they're, they're trying to locate. Uh, what's that scripture in Ecclesiastes? It says, in the day of adversity, consider. You know, don't just think things just happen to you. You're, you're God's child, and... Things just happen. No, things don't. Some things do just happen. I will admit that. Another scripture in Ecclesiastes says, chance happeneth to them all. Speaking of mankind. There are some things happen to you just by chance. Just because you, you know, just because you backed up into a telephone code and broke and busted your car up doesn't mean that God is judging you. It could have just happened by chance. It, God didn't see fit to just you know, move the pole for you or, or, you know, cause you to hit the brake in time or be aware. I mean, part of it's just natural. You know, you know what you learn from, you know, I'm using this because, you know, if y'all seen the right fender to the back of my car, you'll see where I backed up in a telephone pole. It wasn't a telephone pole, by the way. It was, a, it was an electrical pole. I hadn't had it fixed. I'm just kind of, you know, I, I don't know why I hadn't had it fixed yet. I just, I just kind of playing like it ain't there. <laughs> but, but it doesn't mean that God dealt with me about it. But I should consider that maybe He was. But sometimes you still learn naturally. Don't be a dummy and get in a hurry and just back up without looking where you're going. That, that's that's judgment in itself. You know, you learn something from it, you know. Yeah. But there could be a stronger message in it if it is God dealing with you. So I think we should consider everything. But God doesn't see. He's not a cosmic Santa Claus, you know. He's not going to answer you of every little thing you want Him to do. You know, He's not there to do everything. You know, a lot of times God just wants you just... You do it. You can do it. Don't ask me to, you know, punch buttons and move, 
you know, telephone poles and do all this. You, you, you can do some things on your own without my assistance. And I'm not planning on just doing all kinds of miracles for you just because you think that I should. I'm, I'm preaching right now. Anyway, that's my wife, by the way, Brother Wirt, and all, none of the rest of the women do stuff like that. Anyway, uh, so um, the bottom line is we're serving a great God. He, you're, you are an individual member in this. <clears throat> I was going to read you that scripture in, in Ephesians uh, uh, in the fourth chapter. Let me, let me read it right quick. <clears throat> and the... Uh, 15th and 16th verse says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So there's an effective or effectual working in every part or every member of the body and you just happen to be part of that. You're, that's what I'm telling you. You're an individual and you've got a part to play. Nobody else can do your part. You're, nobody has your testimony. And, <clears throat> you know, so... Uh, in God helping us to be individuals and um, individual members that he is working his righteousness in, we're becoming his workmanship. Not that he's wanting to, he, he's not wanting, by the way, to direct every step that you have. He wants to give you the knowledge and renew that knowledge in you that every step you take was directed by his righteousness, but he don't want you, he, he wants you to do your part. He's not just after a bunch of little, you know, bricks that are all made out of the same mold. We're all individuals. We have a place in this, and God's working in our lives individually. And to me, that's something marvelous about God that he's able to let you be who you are and be and, and have a will, but yet your will can become the will of God because it's righteous. He still lets you have your place. He still lets you have your individuality. I know the difference between independence and interdependence. I know the difference. I know that, you know, Interdependence has to do with a group. Inter, being interdependent upon the operation of that group and independence is just being uh, selfishly uh, set apart in a way. But there is, but what I'm telling you is, is that you, you have your part. Uh, God has to work this in us. And, and to me, it is marvelous about God that, that what he's doing in our lives and, you know, since the early church, and I'll, I'll uh, maybe say a couple words more here. I know today's dinner day. If you'll check and see if they're ready for us. Potluck dinner, yes. Let me say something, by the way, about dinner day and potluck dinner. Uh, we have had trouble in the past with it. We have dinner, we have teams that are in charge of dinner day and potluck dinner. And if you would, uh, sometimes we have to kind of corral things down there. That team's working in the kitchen. If you're not on that team, stay out of the kitchen, please. If you, and we do provide like a plate lunch for people that are older, alone, 
uh, needy or whatever reason, if you want a plate to take home with you, just go to the window, and if we have the food, we will. they will gladly fix you a plate to take home. But we cannot have everybody going in the kitchen and just doing whatever they want to do in there with nobody else knowing what's going on. So just... Uh, this is one of those rules that until you become righteous and understanding how it should work, <laughs> you need to follow the rule, okay? Because we just can't have just, you know, everybody coming in and people wondering who's doing what and, you know, what am I supposed to be doing? And So let the teams do their job, and if you need to go in there, you know, or if they ask you to come in there and help them with something, you know, but just leave the teams in there to work and if you uh, are going to go in there or, or if, you, if you need a, a plate, just simply ask for it. They'll be glad to help you. Um, where was I doing? Where was I at? Huh? Is, am I? Uh, I was just talking about the, the end, you know, us being individual or uh, having our own individual calling in the Lord and that he's, he's that great that, that even after you finish this work oh I know what I was going to say I was going to turn to and I'll just do this very quickly uh, 2 Thessalonians see because part of what God's working in us is understanding what took place in the New Testament church and how that church, you know, when you read the New Testament, you have to look at it and say, where's a church like this church I'm reading about? Where is this operation that Paul's writings is, is talking about? And you'll have to understand that that, that church back there fell away and went into darkness. Just We were talking about the, the, the letter to the Gentiles that were coming in back there under Paul's ministry. Well, uh, God was dealing with the Jews and they were ready for a harvest. Jesus told his disciples, you're going to reap where you sowed not. The law of Moses and the prophets had sown a great, harvest of God's word and in prophecy and in the, the law of Moses, the writings of the old covenant that foretold and <clears throat> shown the coming of the Messiah, they planted the coming of the Messiah, Christ, to come in the end of their world and to harvest that world. And Jesus told his disciples, said, you're going to reap where you didn't sow. You're going to reap a harvest that you didn't sow. You're, you're chosen for the reapers in the end of this world. But then Paul planted way back there among the Gentiles and sowed what we'll have to reap down here. When, when this gospel was given to Gentiles, it became much more primitive gospel. They didn't, Gentiles didn't understand the law, the, the Lord of, or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't understand all of the law of Moses and the prophecies. They were ignorant concerning those things. They were idolaters. They were worshipers of false gods. And so they received it on a much lower level. That's why the church fell away and went into darkness. That's how the Catholic Church got started. I mean, they'd done the best that they could do with what they had, but they had very little understanding to work with. And so the church has had to go through uh, a time of darkness and even the time of Reformation, which you know started way back under Martin Luther and all the different organizations of uh, denomination formed after that. That wasn't God's will. That's not biblical. That God's order is certainly not the order uh, of denomination. That's not biblical. It's not New Testament order at all. 
but it's what God had to work out of the darkness of the Gentile world. The obscurity that came in of understanding the divine order of God that was in the early church. And that has to work in us. Before God can come and harvest this world, He's got to get this thing back together to one body and one faith and one spirit and one baptism, one Lord, one Father who's above all and in all. This can't be a bunch of divided separations of God's people. And here in the seventh, in the second, uh, second Thessalonians two, Paul mentioned to them. He, he told them. He said, "Don't let anybody tell you, and don't let, don't listen from to anything is a word from me <coughs> that the day of Christ is at hand." For he said that day is not going to come until there's a falling away first. That scripture is used by most theologians as down here. He wasn't talking to you and me. He was talking to the Thessalonian church 2,000 years ago. And he was telling them, for you Gentiles, this church is going to fall away. And then in the seventh verse of 2 Thessalonians 2, he said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. <clears throat> and so he was just showing them that Iniquity and falsehood was already working, but that there had to be, it had to take place. God, God had to work that. He had to allow it to work. He had to let, and we had to work our way through it. This Gentile world had to work their way through all the things that were picked up during the dark ages, and God, through his reformation, Aren't you thankful for that today, that God has been patient and he's included us, you and I, Gentiles, he's included, and he's been patient. James said, in, in, and he was talking about Jews back there, but, but he said he's patiently waited for the fruit, the precious fruit of the early and latter rain. Well, aren't you glad that he's patiently waited? Now we're in 2000 and... 18, fixing to be 19, is that right? Are y'all going to be able to write that here in about another month? 2019. That's tough for me just to start writing two instead of one there, Brother Tally. One nine, that came easy for me. I was born back in the one nines, way back in the one nines. When it comes to two, for me to make that two, I had a hard time with that for quite a while. But... Now I just got to change that last number. That helps. 2019. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you put two, it, two one two zero one nine, right? Instead of I had to change the one and the nine. That's what Sister McGowan talking about. There is one other woman, brother Work, that does do this kind of thing. Anyway, so. <laughs> Anyway, so <clears throat> anyway, iniquity did set in. But look, let me read you this verse, and I'll set it. I'll, I'll quit. Uh, in Revelations, the fourteenth chapter, and the fourteenth verse, John said, "I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud set." One, one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now we know the hand is the ministry of God, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and a sharp sickle. What's a sickle for? It's for reaping. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So <clears throat> we've looked in the back of the book and we know there's going to be another harvest in the end of the Gentile world like there was in the end of the Jewish world and God is including us. He's, he's, he's given us the patience of these 2,000 years if... if uh, 
if the day of Pentecost was on it was in AD 33 and 2,000 years would be 2033, if it's another 2,000 year world, like the Jewish world was a 2,000 year world, then we're 34 years away from it. No, we're, we're less than that. From 2020 be 13, 14 years away in 2019. So a harvest is coming in the end of this world. You know, I've been looking at, I've been watching different things, news, things on television that tells me that we're living in a world that is far different than any world that, that has existed in the in any time or any situations that's existed in the Gentile world. It's a it is a intricate time that we're living in. We're living when people in America in America did y'all know America is losing the fact that it's a Christian nation? Our last president said it's not a Christian nation anymore. He made those statements. That and 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 I'm sure I, I don't I hadn't heard this one say it yet, but it wouldn't surprise me. We're uh, Mohammedism right now is the fastest growing religion in the world. That's scary to me for America. Any religion outside of Christianity is a, it's a fearful thing for me. But I can see that uh, I can see how it's it's formed into what it is. In a way, I can see it. In another way, it's just an absolute mind-boggling thing to me. But I'm thankful today that His grace has touched me. I'm thankful for the people of God, the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for what He's done and worked in my life. I'm thankful there's such a thing as a new birth that you, you can't just convince me about a religion, but that I can have a personal relationship with God through a, a new birth that no one can take away from me. No one can... Convince me otherwise that I haven't been born again. Hallelujah. Thank God for that birth. Thank God for his touch in my life and what he's worked in my life these many years. I'm thankful today. I give him praise. Hallelujah. His dinner, they got dinner ready downstairs. The potluck dinner is ready. All right. Let's all stand and let's ask God to bless the food and our fellowship downstairs give him another thanks I know you thanked him today thank you brother Wirt for coming and being with us I didn't know they'd let you off duty to do that I guess if there's a fire you'd have to left so thank God there hadn't been no fires <laughs> praise God thank you Lord God for your goodness to us we give you praise today hallelujah hallelujah Oh, God, thank you for the food and the fellowship we're about to partake of. Bless your people, Lord. Oh, God, we're so thankful for your working in our lives and touching us in the way that you have. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, shake hands and be friendly. Brother Wirt, there's food downstairs. If you want to eat with us, you're more than welcome. All right. God bless your hearts. Brothers, If there, um, we're going to move some things from the, the gym real quick to the nursery. If we could just get three or four brothers to help us, that would be great.